So if you would please welcome Mitch Diamond. I want to thank you all for coming out tonight, particularly Lynn for helping run the show, and Fred and Donnie from the Speaker Committee for letting me talk. Uh, you for all braving the blustery night tonight. And uh, I want to particularly give a shout out to Keith Swenson, who, as many of you know, is a regular here, and because of his Purple Hills Books publishing company, enabled me to actually turn this into an actual book which without his help would have been much more difficult and who knows if it would have even happened by now. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here tonight, but uh, I just want to say that. So before we get into this, I want to talk about the idea of ritual. So for a lot of people, ritual just means something that's kind of a repetitive, regular behavior. But that can include things like eating and elimination we're pretty confident that we understand what they're for biologically, and that's not that interesting for us. So I want to talk about things, rituals, that we don't particularly understand quite to that degree. So the focus is on uh, religious rituals, or at least a perspective towards that. Uh, for me, rituals are the behaviors of religion. And that's important because most people tend to talk about religion in terms of belief. So I'm going to read you some book titles. These are recent books. There's a lot of books out there now about belief in religion and why, why, you know, the biology of belief, for instance. There's The Cognitive Psychology of Belief in the Supernatural. That's a book. God is Watching You, How the Fear of God Makes Us Human. The Illusion of God's Presence, The Biological Origins of Spiritual Longings. There's a problem with the science of belief, it's kind of dicey at best. You know, they, it's not to say that there isn't any science in it, but approaching belief from a scientific point of view is not really, I think, the best way of doing it. The best way to do it is to look at behavior. Behavior has a solid scientific basis, and we'll look at a lot of that tonight. But even if you want to focus on belief as your approach to why people have religion and ritual, you still have to explain ritual. Uh, you know, there's all this behavior that, you know, I'm going to give examples of, but you know a lot of them. And people tend not to look at those. And that's a, it's a huge omission. You can't just have a science of belief, so-called, without including the ritual behavioral part of this. So that's what I want to talk about tonight. I mean, in fact, you could even have... Um, belief in superpowers, and that would be all you needed, you wouldn't have to have rituals. I mean, they're, they're, they're kind of two separate things. Definition or purpose of ritual. Like so many human characteristics, it depends who you ask. <sighs> we want to see some examples. So all I did here was go on the internet and did a search for definition of ritual, purpose of ritual. And you get all this stuff, and it's all over the map. There's a few similarities here and there. Community social bonds, strengthening the bonds, attaching the believer to God's. But in general, there's very little symmetry or consensus about what all this stuff is about. So instead, let's take a look at what are examples of rites and rituals. So on the left, we have 13 specifically uh, religious rituals, according to Anthony Wallace, who wrote a book in 1966, called The Anthropology of Religion. On the right, we have another anthropologist, Catherine Bell, who takes a more expansive view of rights, political rights, and, and things that may or may not be religious. But again, the point is, it's all over the map. It just depends who you're talking to, and the perspectives vary quite widely. I also want to point out, I just listed just some examples of modern secular rituals, sports, elections, graduations, Thanksgiving and New Year's, which we don't think of as particularly religious, but they are a kind of ritual in our society. All these rituals describe many different activities. My focus is on the personal experience of religious rituals. So I'm going to give a possible definition 
a ritual according to this one person who wrote it rather recently, Annette. I happen to like it, not that I necessarily agree with it so much, but I thought it was a good uh, talking point. Ritual is a performance which may emphasize personal, social, economic, religious, or political aspects of human life, and which may consist of elements such as ritualized, a poor choice of words to define itself, symbolic, magical, and technical actions, objects, language, in various forms, music meals, and natural and supernatural participants. So, this is, to me, the kitchen sink approach of anything that could possibly fit in, you put it up there. And at a certain point, when you've thrown everything at it, then you really don't have anything. If, you, if, if everything counts, then nothing counts. We need to get a little more specific to what we're trying to do here. I did want to point out that the observers and the audience are participants in the ritual as well as the performers. And an important question that I'm asking is, that, is if rituals are non-adaptive byproducts or evolved adaptations. So that's the setup. Now let's look at my perspective on it. We're going to look at the biological, biological characteristics of religious ritual behavior as I see it. They originated in preliterate tribal groups at least 40,000 years ago. Some people think maybe 100,000 years or longer. Depends what kind of evidence you need. But regardless, humans have lived in hunter-gatherer tribal groups between 95 and 99% of the existence of humans. Which means that if we're going to understand it, we have to look at what hunter-gatherer tribes did to understand where, where ritual came from and why they might be doing it. Rituals are universal in human cultures across time. We continue to do these rituals just as they did, similarly at least, to what they did thousands of years ago. And all known cultures have rituals, religious rituals. They're characterized by rigidity and stereotypy, persistent repetitious acts. They are seemingly non-utilitarian. They don't seem to have a reason or benefit. They lack rational motivation. In fact, according to Boyer and Leonard, a series of articles that they wrote, Rituals swamp working memory and permit the temporary suppression of intrusive thoughts. It's kind of odd. Rituals are seemingly evolutionarily expensive. They are a big time and resource commitment. I just want to say they don't, they don't seemingly provide the things we typically think about in terms of what it needs to, to thrive and survive. They don't uh, gather food, you know, the activities don't get food, they don't build shelter, they don't defend the tribe. And lastly, they elicit or stimulate emotion, which I'm going to be talking about in a number of examples. Okay, so now we want to look at biological approaches to understand ritual. How do we look at ritual in order to understand it from a scientific point of view. It has to be what can be observed and measured. That's the basis of the scientific method. So we want to identify behaviors ethologically. What are the actions of ritual? Here we have Jane Goodall, perhaps the most famous ethologist, with a chimp in her uh, Gombe Reserve, where she studied them and got famous for it. But of course, there are thousands of, of scientists out there studying animal behavior in the wild and in the lab. We can take a neurological or physiological uh, approach to identify the effects and responses that ritual has. Here we have brain scans, and we'll look at some examples of that. But you can also look at it in terms of uh, heart rate, blood pressure, Skin conductance, uh, galvanic skin response. This is one of the techniques they use in polygraphs, lie detector tests, to determine emotional response. So there's a number of ways you can go. Is there a genetic contribution? Are there innate predispositions for ritual? Does it improve evolutionary fitness? We sort of asked that question before. Does it aid survival and reproductive success? So that's what we're trying to determine here, what we want to look at from my point of view. 
So now we're going to talk about the big five rituals. These are not by any means the only rituals, but these are the ones I focus on, and I'll explain why. Art, music, dance, mythology, and prayer. So why these five? They're observable ethologically. We can see them. We can pretty much, for the most part, know that they're that we can observe people doing them. We don't have to ask their opinion about what's happening. We know it when we see it. They can be measured physiologically for the same reasons I just talked about. And they are components of more complex rituals. So, we have rituals like festivals and ceremonies, rites of passage, sacrifice. They're all legitimate rituals, but they're very high level. They could mean a lot of different things depending on the particular culture. These five tend to be components of the bigger ritual practices. So these are like the lowest common denominator for me. All right, so now we'll start looking at some specifics. The ethology or behaviors of ritual, what do we see? So again, just to reiterate, it's the movements that count, not what people think or believe. There's lots of overlap within religious rituals so that Here's a picture of the Balinese mask dance, uh, which includes uh, dance, music, mythology. They're telling a mythology when they do it, and art, the mask, and some of the other accoutrements, and perhaps even prayer. I'm not so sure, but it's possible. Uh, and then there's this guy named Jay Fearman, who has proposed this concept called LSV behavior, a rather tortured acronym, but he describes it as make oneself lower or smaller or more vulnerable. That's what he calls LSV behavior. And we know it from monotheistic religions, Christianity, Judaism, and, and um, uh, Islam. Bowing, prostrating oneself, kneeling, anything to lower oneself. Typically, it's thought of that you're... Um, lowering yourself in the eyes of God, that you recognize God as the all-powerful and you are just a poor little human. And so the, the ritual of doing these things is acknowledging this fact. But it also tends to be very similar to the dominance hierarchy idea, which ethologists are very fond of. And so uh, I'm not going to go into the dominance hierarchy. I hope you kind of know what that means. But humans have dominance hierarchies just like other animals. And this one was a little study that I found, which I, I just liked. Six-month-old babies prefer their mother's singing over her speaking voice. How do they do that? I mean, they, they have the mother and the baby, and they, they actually record them on video. And the recorder's talking to the baby, and then at another time, they record her singing to the baby, and they record it, and then they, they measure the attention that the baby gives. And they, this, I mean, there's a lot of studies with babies in various ways where they've determined, they believe, that babies are more interested or liked or, or liking uh, certain behaviors like singing. But I just thought it's pretty cool because it suggests that um, music may be something that isn't, that there's a predisposition to like music before we begin to like specific forms of music as we get older. It's always an issue of whether, you know, sure, we all like music, we all learn to like the music that we grew up with, but is it that training that made us like music, or did we have a predisposition to like music from the beginning? It's more ethology of ritual. Now we get into this thing called altered states of consciousness and dissociative states. Many of you are familiar with the fact that there are cultures where people have altered states of consciousness, which they, um, I mean, they can be a whole range of behaviors, but they can get up to ultimately what you would consider in this society to be full-blown psychotic behaviors, where they completely change the personalities and completely lose the idea of, of who they are in their normal life and become, they think they are actually something else, oftentimes an animal spirit or things like that. Uh, some of the descriptions of these are, are mystical ecstasies, meditation, trance, possession states, 
They can be induced by things like uh, fasting, scourging, kind of deprivations, stress, exhaustion, and of course, drugs. Uh, and certainly in our society, there are, aside from the recreational drugs that people do, there are actual studies that take place and have taken place in the United States and other Western countries where they intentionally give people psychedelics or what is more officially called entheogens like psilocybin, mescaline, DMT, dimethyltryptamine. And see what happens. And what often happens is that people who ingest these drugs have what could only be described as sacred or transcendent experiences. And this can include people who have no previous obvious religious attachments, no particular beliefs in gods, but they, under the influence of these drugs, report things that we describe as having religious experiences. We'll look a little bit more at that later. Um, in modern society, there's also this thing about raves and concerts. There's this fellow in the East Bay, actually. His name is Robin Sylvan. He's written a couple books about rave culture and music culture, and he claims that a, a lot of these behaviors are ways for people to engage in a, um, uh, altered states of consciousness. He says, at one point, trance induction for the dancers carries them beyond their normal consciousness into a powerful ecstatic state. I happen to believe that a lot of these behaviors are substitutes for absent rites of passage. Now, I mentioned a couple early on, some, some secular ones like graduation, and, and of course there's even religious ones like bar mitzvahs and confirmations, but those are nothing like the old traditional tribal rites of passage that were actually very brutal and painful and exhausting, and they put these kids through hell to get them from their state of childhood into the state of adulthood, which is the purpose of those rites of passage. And so it's my feeling, and there's other people who feel this way, that, that this lack in our modern society is manifested by adolescents rebelling, number one, but in the way they do it. Piercings, tattoos these days, they wear black clothes, some people would say that that's a symbol of death, a metaphorical death, death to childhood as an attempt to move into adulthood. These behaviors are too ubiquitous to persist accidentally. These exist, again, of course, in tribal cultures everywhere, but they, the fact that they exist here in modern cultures and you see various manifestations of it suggests that there really is an internal need to do this and we're not providing that kind of um, uh, structure for them to do that. All rituals elicit emotion. Emotions repeatedly show up in descriptions of ritual, but almost no one leverages that to explain the function or purpose of rituals. Part of that is because they focus on beliefs What are emotions? Of course, that itself is a whole big discussion. But I picked Joseph Ledoux's uh, definition. He's a, a well-known neurophysiologist in New York who's written a number of books about emotion. He says, emotions are neural systems that mediate behavioral interactions with the environment, particularly behaviors that take care of the fundamental problems of survival. The fundamental problems of survival. Now, that is kind of a powerful thing to say. And then to have these rituals that elicit emotions and having to do with the fundamental problems of survival, wow, there's kind of, that's, that's heavy. <laughs> okay, I'm going to give you a couple uh, perspectives on dance now, and then I'll, I'll show you why I bring them up. There's this guy, Ivar Hagendurn, who talks about the definition or purpose of dance. In his perspective, he says, Dance is the completion of anticipated movement resulting in emotional satisfaction. Okay. 
Then there's this group, Dale, Hollerman, and Hyatt, who say, emotionally, dance is emotionally expressive use of the body. Dance is conscious choices made by the dancer about what moves to make. So this is an example of what often happens in, in, the, in, the, in the analysis of ritual. So we have completion of anticipated movement. We have conscious choices made by the dancer. Very different approaches to what ritual is. But underneath it, they all say the same thing. It's emotional satisfaction, emotionally expressive use of the body. Emotions are always in there, and it turns out it ends up being about the only thing that you can say is consistent across these behaviors. I bring up this thing about Peter Gabriel because if you're looking for it, you find it all the time. So this was just a week ago in The Guardian online. And uh, it's a little hard to see, but um, in the first paragraph above him, it says, uh, whether releasing sadness or sh sending shivers down the spines, our songs in our emotional toolbox can transform daily life. Below, he also, he says, um, Art is a mechanism which takes an ice pick to the heart. In other words, there is a role for music in opening up channels of feeling that have become damned by habit, caution, excessive individualism, or the demands of daily life. At the bottom, he also mentions the emotional toolbox again and suggests that music, in the very best sense, are the therapists of our souls. Again, what happens is he talks about... Uh, Ha uh, we've become damned by habit, caution, excessive individualism, the demands of daily life. Another slew of possible explanations for doing it. But underpinning it all is emotion. And again, too many people aren't asking why that is. It's the emotion that matters. That is a physiological response that we all have inside us. It needs to be looked at much more closely. Physiology of music. Favorite music can elicit chills and emotional reaction. And chills is also the same thing as saying shivers down the spine. And a number of scientists have actually done this study that they can elicit chills rather reliably from people's favorite music. Chills correlates to increased blood flow to the brain's reward regions. Music also stimulates other limbic emotional areas. And they find that music has distinct emotional pathways for music processing. People identify the same emotions in other cultures' music. So what you do is you take a recording of some songs, something that we would consider a sad song, a happy song, a scary song. There's lots of different emotions that you can identify, that we would identify in songs that we know. Take it to a culture that you hope, at least the scientists would have you believe, that has not been exposed to Western music. And you play the song, and you ask them, what's the emotion in the song? And they correctly identify the sad songs, the happy songs, the scary songs, whatever. And this is not that different from uh, the work that Paul Ekman did. Anybody know Paul Ekman and his facial emotion studies? Sean knows. <laughs> Okay, you saw the TV show. So what Paul Ekman did is instead of music, he took pictures of people with specific facial emotions, angry people's faces, sad, happy, whatever. And did the same thing. He took it to a culture that hadn't been exposed to Western ideas, and he said, what's the emotion in the faces? And they correctly identified the emotions exactly the same. So we have two different examples of that, one with the uh, facial emotions, one with the musical emotions. It used to be thought that these kinds of emotions would be learned from our culture. We would learn what happiness, happy music is by being in a culture that sort of said, here's the happy music. But it suggests that there's something that's deeper in us, and it isn't solely the fact that we learn it through our culture. So, leading the scientists to say there is some invariance in basic emotions across musical cultures. Um, 
Brain lesions can lead to loss of musical cognition. There's lots of different kinds of brain lesions that have all kinds of effects, but there are some that seem to affect our musical perception specifically. For example, a person can lose the ability to recognize a tune but still perceive the emotions in it. Many of you know who Oliver Sacks is. He just died last year. He wrote a book called Musicophilia. And that book specifically addresses a whole lot of examples of brain damage that has all kinds of different effects on people's ability to enjoy or perceive or to play music. Even, at least one case, where he said a person who had a certain kind of brain damage ended up being a musical savant after, before the brain damage, not being particularly interested or adept at music. That, more than anything, blew me away. I'm going to read something uh, uh, that's related to this. A woman had bilateral brain damage to her auditory cortex, the, the hearing cortex. Her language abilities, memory, and intelligence were normal. She was able to differentiate the emotional content of music, which music was happy or sad. Where she failed was in her ability to recognize music. When presented with the melody of Happy Birthday without its lyrics, the patient would say, I don't know that tune, but it sounds happy. A little more physiology of ritual. Brain scans of praying nuns and meditating Buddhists. There's a fellow named Andrew Newberg who's written several books about religion, belief, the biology of all that. He particularly studies... Uh, he did the brain scans. He's probably the most famous guy for doing it, getting nuns to pray and, and meditating Buddhists. And not, you know, these are serious meditators and serious praying, not, not trivial stuff. Oh, sorry. Um, um, and, and what he found was that an area of the brain called the um, orientation association area was inhibited. And this area of the brain is known to be responsible for our sense of ourself in space. And I find that to be, and a lot of people do, incredibly interesting because what happens when people have transcendent or spiritual experiences? They tend to describe things like unity, transcendence of time and space, sacredness, intuitive knowledge, ineffability, nirvana. There's all kinds of descriptions for this experience. But they, again, it's, it's kind of this universal thing that people have. And we find this brain area that suggests that our perception of self and space versus non-self kind of gets inhibited, which means that you don't have that sense of yourself as much as you start to feel that you're out there a bit more. I think it's pretty cool. A study at NASA Ames and Mountain View, of all places, did a study of art, art, art emotions. And the way they did it was they would give a subject a cognitive task, a math task, or something that was a bit difficult to perform. But while the person was doing that, they put a picture in front of them. Now, that picture might be a natural picture of trees. A drawing of trees is nice. Or there was a picture of trees that was more impressionistic, kind of stippled. You could tell it was trees, but it was not quite as straightforward. And then there was abstract art. There was a bunch of lines and certain patterns, but it didn't correspond to anything that we would recognize as existing in the real world. What did they find? They found that the trees reduced stress. Of course, the guy's strapped, and you know they've got all the polygraph stuff on him to, to measure his stress reactions. The natural image of trees reduced his stress while he was doing the cognitive task, and the abstract art increased stress, and the um, impressionist version in the middle had less effect either way. The science of the physiology of mythology is kind of missing. It's kind of it bugs me because it seems so obvious. I call the pro pro progeny of mythology fiction, literature, and poetry. Stories, narrative. That's what mythology was originally, and we've, it's sort of evolved into 
these kinds of things that we do now, movies and books, fiction. But they all stimulate emotional responses. The thing is, there, no one really asks that question. I mean, we know that when we go to a movie, if it's a tearjerker romance, if it's a scary movie, if it's a war movie, uh, uh, a comedy, whatever, there's, there's, you know, we enjoy these things because they stimulate us emotionally. It's real obvious, but no one's done the studies to show it. Now, a lot of people say that the purpose of mythology is to help people rehearse. How would I react in a situation that the myth describes, if I was in that situation? Sounds good, right? A lot of people say that. But is that really what you're going to see the horror movie for, the, the chainsaw guy with the mask? because you think that you have to rehearse how you're going to react when the chainsaw guy comes after you in the, in the house? I don't know. And similarly for, you know, the, the haunted house movies with the, the poltergeists and the demons and all this stuff. You really, I mean, here in this place, we all know that that doesn't exist. So why do they need to rehearse that? It's not because they really expect... Maybe they do expect that it's going to happen in real life, but I don't think that that's a good enough reason. It's about the emotions for itself. Also, think about tr more traditional myths, like the Greeks and the Roman myths or the Norse myths, really myths you know, in, the old, in the older societies. What were, what were going on in those myths? You had gods and people fighting, philandering, power-grabbing manipulations, love lost, love gained, exactly what people do. That's all it is, is the projection of people's own psychic predispositions with a lot of emotional involvement in it. What are the evolutionary advantages of ritual? Well, there are some. Music, dance, and art are medical and psychological therapies, in fact. In hospital settings, music decreases anxiety, heart rate, and blood pressure. It reduces the need for sedatives and analgesics for painkillers. It increases relaxation and improves mood. There's a slew of studies that show this. Dance improve and movement improve Parkinson's and multiple sclerosis symptoms and lowers risk of dementia, among other things. No one claims that these ritual behaviors cure any of this, but at least it reduces the symptoms. Art therapy allows awareness and expression of an individual's deepest emotions. This is from a, a study that comes, so the American Art Therapy Association has this art therapy outcome and single subject studies summary, which is really a list of all the studies they find to show why art therapy is a good thing. Obviously, they want to promote that. And one of the studies that I found through them says that the therapy is about expression of an individual's deepest emotions, emotions again. So, in summary, art therapy reduces problems due to abuse, chemical dependency, traumatic brain injury, developmental disabilities, and psychological consequences of breast cancer. And that's just a few of the things that they claim. More evolutionary advantages of ritual. The benefits of prayer are fraught with methodological problems because of the bias of bias, particularly when experimenters are religious. So there's a lot of people out there who want you to believe that prayer is a good thing. I'm not saying it is or it isn't. Well, actually, I am, but we'll, we'll get there. Um, but, but from a scientific point of view, it's tough because a lot of the uh, people who, want, who have this bias or have this agenda to promote prayer, they're using very vague measures in their studies like frequency of church attendance and prayer, religious denomination, degree of religious orthodoxy, or other demographic or lifestyle influences. And they get... So there's been uh, some critics of these studies, and those critics have gone in and, and pointed out these, these methodological problems. 
we need better metho methodology and standards for these studies. However, there certainly is some indication that prayer helps people. What we, so one way that we can do a better job of, of understanding the effect of prayer is to, is to measure things that are real specific like cardiac or circulatory outcomes. So in one study, the guy had people do the Ave Maria prayer or a yoga mantra and found, in fact, that it improved cardiac and circulatory outcomes. And this guy says the rosary might be viewed as a health practice as well as a religious practice. So it's nice when they can measure something that you're pretty solid about. Prayer is a self-administered placebo. There may be other people that believe this or say this, but I haven't seen it. This is what I believe. Seventy-nine percent of the respondents to a poll believe that the spiritual faith can help people recover from disease, and 63 percent believe that physicians should talk to patients about spiritual faith. This is the problem with going down this path about prayer, because some of these people want to make prayer part of your medical care. I don't think that's a very wise thing. And so it, gets to, it almost is more of a political issue than it is a scientific issue. But nevertheless, placebo, now forget placebo in terms of prayer, but placebo by itself, has cer I don't need that, has been certainly shown to, be, uh, to help with Parkinson's depression and pain clearly. And there's some other things we're studying, and it's a little less clear if placebo is beneficial for that. But how does a placebo work? First of all, I mean, I guess I should say what placebo is. I, I think most of you should know, but it's a, it's a, it's a medicine, a so-called medicine, that really has no uh, real medicine in it, or a procedure or practice that makes you believe that it's going to help you, but has no proven benefit. But the belief that you are getting something that helps you actually has the effect of, of helping you get better in many cases. And so I think because of the way people believe in prayer and they believe in their religion, that it's, a, it's, it's kind of a, a, well, it ends up helping them actually have better medical and psychological outcomes because of that. Wouldn't work for us. We don't believe for better or for worse. I'm not sorry that I don't believe, but at the same time, the people who do believe actually might get a benefit from it. Uh, Carl Jung, the psychotherapist, I'm gonna read something he said. Patients force the psychotherapist into the role of the priest and expect and demand of him that he shall free them from their distress. We psychotherapists must occupy ourselves with problems which, strictly speaking, belong to the theologian. So, it used to be, in traditional societies, you'd have a shaman or a priest, and that was the medicine man in many cases. But of course, in modern society, things have changed, and now the priest is a separate role than the doctor. But then there's this new thing called the psychotherapist. And that guy has somehow fallen into this role that used to belong to the theologians. And, it, and I make the connection that it has to do with ritual because the psychotherapists in many cases are using art, dance, music, therapy, a ritual behavior. Is there a genetic connection to rituals? AVPR1A has strong links to musical ability. Some studies have shown. Williams syndrome is a deletion of 15 genes in chromosome 7. Here's a Williams person playing the guitar. Many Williams people have extraordinary musical talent. 
I'm going to read. Well, first of all, just before we get to the, the Williams people in general have severe mental retardation and are described as having elfin facial features. So this is a, an excerpt from uh, the guy who, uh, a guy who studied Williams syndrome. Even though their attention span for most tasks is short, many will listen to music, sing and play instruments with astonishing persistence. Most cannot read musical notes, yet some have perfect or nearly perfect pitch and an, and an uncanny sense of rhythm. One boy quickly learned to play an extremely complex drum beat in 7-4 time with one hand while drumming in 4-4 time with the other hand. A number of individuals retain complex music for years, remembering melodies and verses of long ballads. One can even sing songs in 25 languages. Experienced, music, experienced Williams musicians also sing harmonies, improvise, and compose lyrics readily. They also show significantly more interest in and emotional responsivity to music than do subjects from the general population. Very strong indication there is some kind of musical genetic predisposition. Dance genes, they've identified the same gene AVPR1A as in music and a gene called SLC6A4 and one of the people who did the study said, significant differences were observed in allele, or gene frequencies, for both genes when dancers were compared to athletes as well as to non-dancers, non-athletes. Now, given that, this is only correlational. It is not causal. We're a long way from understanding the actual mechanisms for how they work. However, there's a lot of information that suggests there's something going on there. And of course, requires a lot more study to, to nail it down. But I think we've got a lot going towards the suggestion that there is a genetic component to ritual. Evolution and ritual. In his book, How the Mind Works, Steven Pinker says, art and mythologies tickle our pleasure centers like cheesecake does. And all are non-adaptive byproducts. They no, have no intrinsic value. On the other hand, in God Delusion, Richard Dawkins says, Darwinian selection targets and eliminates waste. Nature is a miserly accountant, grudging the pennies, watching the clock, punishing the smallest extravagance. Now, I've spoken up here a few times, and every chance I get, I give you that Dawkins quote. <laughs> punishing the smallest extravagance. Now, remember we said rituals are time and resource consuming. They are evolutionarily expensive. People put a lot of effort into these rituals when they could be doing the, the food gathering and the, the, mate, the mate chasing and all these other things. And when they're doing something which ostensibly has no benefit, theoretically. So we've got this conflict here. How can we be doing things so much that's not adaptive and has no value, yet Evolution punishes the smallest extravagance. They don't go together. I side with Dawkins on this one. I think Steven Pinker is wrong. All right, so now we're going to summarize what we've done. Why religious rituals are biologically evolved and adaptive. They're ubiquitous over time in geography. They're evolutionarily costly yet persistent. Dedicated brain pathways and regions, specifically for music. We just don't know so much about the other rituals. They tap into human emotional systems. They provide health and psychological benefits. We're beginning to find genetic contributions to ritual behaviors. They lack rational motivation and interfere with standard cognition. Swamping working memory was one example, and also the altered states of consciousness and emotional arousal. It's quite remarkable that we have these things that interfere with our standard cognition. It doesn't make sense, maybe. That we enjoy rituals is itself evidence that they are evolved adaptations, if you believe evolution punishes the smallest extravagance. By divorcing gods and belief from them, rituals retain their attraction 
and potency in modern times. It's the behaviors that count, not beliefs. The fact that we all here enjoy these rituals, music, dance maybe, art, mythology, we're always going to movies, reading books, entertaining ourselves, getting emotional response from engaging in these behaviors. Now, I called them religious rituals because traditionally that's what they were. But we need to rethink what's going on here. Whether or not you want to call them religious rituals, I don't care. It's the behaviors. We like ritual, and we do them. We continue to do them. There's no change in that. In fact, if anything, we're doing it more than ever now that we can have music in our pocket and be carrying it around all the time and listening to it all the time. Thank you very much. All righty. Thank you, Mitchell. Uh, we're going to do a QA session. If you have a question, raise your hands. I'll bring the microphone to you. And we will go from there. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, my question is, uh, you mentioned studies where people's faces were when they were happy, when they were sad, they were given to people in different um, settings to ask them if they were happy or sad, and they were able to understand a happy face is a happy face across multiple different tribes. And the same thing with uh, music, this is a happy song, a sad song. Yes. Has there been a study for uh, just voices and just normal spoken word? You know, like, because if I'm angry, I'm typically more, you know, my voice is lower or what have you, or happier, it's higher. Have they, has there been a study for just spoken words? Um, well, it's interesting. The, what comes to mind, uh, a talk I gave some time ago here was actually about um, cognitive biases. So one of the biases that I was talking about, not a specific bias, but um, they did a study during the Kennedy-Nixon debate in 1960. People who listened on the radio to the debate liked Nixon better because he had, presumably because he had a deeper voice. People who watched it on TV liked Kennedy better because he was more handsome and maybe carried himself better visually. But of course, they said the same thing. It doesn't matter how you heard it or saw it. The content was the same, but yet you get a different response. And this, the people who did the study felt that it's this bias that whether it's the auditory bias of a deeper voice versus a visual bias of liking more, a more attractive candidate. So that's just the example that comes to mind to address what you're saying. Okay, thanks. Mitch, so when you said that you favored Dawkins over um, Pinker, on religious ritual, do you mean that since it, is, since, since it still persists, it does provide advantage? Yes. I mean, that's not, Dawkins didn't say anything about ritual in that quote. He was talking about evolution. But, but yes, ritual persists. We continue to have these practices, these behaviors. And so, uh, if I'm answering your question correctly, the idea is that we wouldn't do them if they weren't beneficial at some level. And I think the way to understand them as beneficial goes through our emotional system. I was wondering whether um, the advantage that it could be offering is that it allows choosing a mate based on whether they don't miss whatever it would, uh, I'm not necessarily saying this right. Basically, um, if I can afford to spend some time singing, then that means that I'm doing all right in the other ways, so it's a sign of my being, having more left over, right? If a woman, a female is looking for a mate who is, um, who can provide, then it would be someone who had a little bit of effort left over so that they could um, 
offer, you know, so that they could do singing and dancing? I think certainly in some cases that's true. There are certainly tribes that I'm aware of where the available males have a ritual dance. I think it's Africa, perhaps Maasai, I can't remember exactly, where they jump. They jump up and down, and they jump up and down for a long time. And it's supposed to show their strength and their, their vigor. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's part of it. But then, of course, there's rituals for completely different reasons that have nothing to do with sexual selection. So rituals function for a lot of different reasons, and, and sex is one of them, certainly, to attract mates. But it's only one of many reasons. You mentioned rituals um, perhaps existed 40,000 years back. And I guess I'd offer that perhaps it's much earlier than that even. Um, Michael Shermer gives the example in his books about uh, the believing brain that if you present options for a chicken in a box to peck on a certain spot and at random it provides him food, then um, the chicken, if if it just happens by accident to be have done a circle, just dance before pecking and it got food that time, it will repeat that pattern over and over in, in attempts to obtain the food by, by turning in a circle just before pecking. And, and so this type of ritual is innate in us, I think, a lot longer, earlier developed than, than 40,000 years ago. <laughs> uh. There's uh, B.F. Skinner who talked about the pigeon, the ritual pigeon, right? I think it's a similar concept. Uh, certainly ritual exists in animals, but it tends to be defined in a very specific way. Ritual in, in animals is for the purpose of communication with conspecifics, with other members of its own group. Uh, whereas I think rituals for humans goes a bit beyond that. So, you know, perhaps you could make the connection that, that there's some basis that we inherited, some ritual behaviors, but we just expanded it so far beyond what those animals were doing that it, it, it kind of loses the, the connection. I mean, yes, in some specific instances, maybe, but it goes way past that. So when you say that uh, ritual is resource intensive, uh, would you mean specifically for the individual or would it, I mean, because it seems to me like ritual can actually draw people together and kind of community and you have an overall net resource gain at that point. I mean, so, I mean, couldn't that be one of the reasons why it would be persistent over such a long period of time? Yes, you brought up the, the big thing, which is social cohesion, right? Group cohesion, reason for ritual. And I would say that, in general, most people buy that. I'll tell you why I don't. There's this fellow, Werner Haig, who gave a talk some time ago here about a book called The Bonobo and the Atheist by a guy named Franz de Waal. One of the things in that book and that Werner talked about was that morality is something that we've inherited from our primate ancestors. That it isn't simply something that we learn. To, is that right? Yeah, basically. Even early. Well, before primates, but yes. At least for us it was the primates, but it certainly goes back before that. Um, so we inherited morality from our primate ancestors. Morality being, at least conceptually, one of the things that societies use for the purpose of social cohesion and cooperation. Now, tribal hunter-gatherer societies were very much like chimp and gorilla societies, far more than they are like us, in terms of the number of individuals and, the, and lifestyle. Advisedly, there's obviously a transition, but given that thousands of animal species have perfectly adequate social cohesion mechanisms, group cohesion mechanisms, why did humans need to have ritual and religion for the purpose of increasing 
group cohesion. Especially if, if, as some of us believe, that we actually already inherited a lot of the mechanisms for group cohesion before religion was ever around. Uh, but I'm not done yet. Okay. <laughs> I mean, most people are, when they hear the idea that, that uh, ritual and religion are Im improve group cohesion, it's like, yeah, it makes sense. It does make sense. And, and I don't disagree that it happens. I'm not saying that it isn't true, but I don't think it's the real reason for these things. There's something more basic, more elementary. Um, so if you, if you say that group cohesion, uh, we need group cohesion, all right, let me back up. If we need ritual and religion to improve group cohesion, well, why is that specifically? Instead of just saying, yeah, it sounds good, what actually happened that we actually need that? It's a difficult issue. The best answer I've heard, not the, that I like it so much, but people say, well, it's because humans are more complex. We have more complex societies, even though for 90-something per percent of our existence, we lived in hunter-gatherer societies that were more like chimps than, than like we are today. But w what was it that actually that we need to have this, this extra ritual thing for group cohesion. So if it's got to do with our c complex brain, our bigger brain, our intelligence, well, why don't we just use our bigger intelligence, our better intelligence, to solve problems of group cohesion? Why did we develop this completely irrational set of behaviors that are rituals that don't make any sense that are not rational, to solve problems of group cohesion. I mean, there's, no one's really answered the question. I mean, again, it sounds good, but no one's really said why. Why did we need these behaviors for group cohesion? I haven't heard a good answer. Maybe it was just random and it the words. Yeah, that's not good enough for me. Okay, guys, this is going to be the... Is this on? Is this on? I guess it, oh, there, it is on, sorry. It's because I'm walking around. Uh, this is going to be the last question, guys. Oh, wow. Yeah. Last question. <laughs> um, I don't know if this is... I can hear you. Good. Uh, I was curious about the uh, studies that, you know, said Ave Maria and the uh, Sanskrit thing were effective. Um, I, I guess I would kind of, I'm, I'm a little skeptical about that because uh, there's just so many ways to go wrong with that in terms of setting up That's controls right. and stuff like that. And I was just wondering if you knew, had looked into the details of the... Uh, well, that particular one, I mean, I took it fairly at face value, and the reason I liked it is because they're measuring blood pressure and heart rate, circulatory outcomes. So... I did talk about the fact that there are a lot of these studies on prayer, but it could certainly include, well, the Ave Maria prayer is an example, but other behaviors, yoga, meditation, where it, it's good to be skeptical, and I agree with you. And so you have to look at the studies. And there are plenty of, you know, these are peer-reviewed studies, which means that there's plenty of people out there going, I don't know about this. You know, you need to really prove it. But in, in science, it means that someone's got to go and repeat it and get the same results. So have that, has that been done? And I don't know specifically, but I, I think you, you make a, a valid critique. But at the same time, it's also good to know what people are saying. And I think, again, there's a lot of indication that in that direction that there is some benefit one way or another Maybe, you know, how do you do the study? So, so here's another thought. You know, we talked about yoga and meditation. Those are very popular practices in our society right now. Why do people do that? Why are people so entranced with meditation and yoga? What's happening while they're doing that? Focus on your breathing. Stop thinking about all the rat race stuff. 
In meditation, shut it down, right? How would we describe what you're trying to do with meditation? Quiet your mind, right? Same with yoga. Focus on your breathing. Try and get rid of all that other stuff. Suppress the noise in your head. And we had a number of instances throughout this talk swapping working memory, altered states of consciousness, emotions. To me, now I, I'm on kind of dicey ground here, but the idea that emotions are sort of antithetical in some instances to the noise in your head. You can debate that one, and I wouldn't disagree with you, but there's a lot of stuff going on here that says something about all the stuff in your head, you need to, to put it aside, to suppress it a little bit, and that's what rituals are doing. Why is that? I'll be, if anybody's interested, $15. Such a deal. <laughs> I'll even sign it if you want. All right, everyone, let's give our buddy Mitchell Diamond a hand.